Hey YouTube, I decided to read this uh, little piece that I wrote a few years back. Um, and sorry for the, the buzzing that you might hear, but I um, don't know how to get that to stop. I have the, the, the range of the, the boost and the volume and everything, certain levels, and it's kind of unavoidable. But anyway, hopefully you get the impact of this anyway, so I'll just get right to it. It's called The Slut Jesus Loved. The Pharisees. You know them for who they are today, for they are the same as they always were. Dragging in the lowly sinner, loaded down with dirty, bulky sacks of guilt, shame, and condemnation that they always burdened their congregations with for years unending, causing them to walk with a stoop, or at the very least a limp, constantly letting them know how unworthy they are of God, and that they should be trying ever harder to dance on the head of a pen, to live a pure, holy, sterilized life of abstaining from the dangerous evils of this world as they crack the cold, stinging whip of pure human perfection. Perhaps they burst into the middle of a sweaty escapade, her eyes looking out through stringy hair, lavishing a man who could finally love her, a man who wouldn't beat her like a creep of a husband, perhaps a man that they prepared to seduce her. And here they come, those praying vultures, those slithering snakes, not caring whether the deed itself hurts the one who does it, not caring at all whether their own congregation is stuck in the mire of depravity, although they preach rough-tongued sermons about the nature of sin every Sabbath, satisfy their own pitiful longings for an abstract truth. Just looking, searching, grabbing for something, someone, to test the master to his utter limits, whether it pains him or not to see them in such a wretched state, in order to give them reason to hang his naked, exposed body in front of the whole world, this demonized rebel who dares to challenge the power of the religious order of the day. And now they toss her before him. And now they finally have him back into a corner. It's either our way or the highway, they think. Stone her as the law requires, and the Romans will have your hide side with the prevailing Roman law, and God himself will convict you of your hypocrisy and split the high heavens with the roar, hot-blasting fire, and unrepentant lightning to blot the very memory of you from the face of the earth. And Jesus looks down, he's thinking, not out of bewilderment of what to do, that total bewilderment of the gall of it, of what it takes to make a man so twisted that he could even think of using this pitiful human being and with a r broken heart and a guilty conscience jolting down her spine as a pawn in their evil game of religious chess. This movement of wooden kings and bishops, this cold-hearted scheme of shifty eyes and cackling smiles over a cringing form caught in the midst of this tangled web. And who knows for sure what he's writing in the sand, but as the Torah, the ancient law, scrolls through his mind, it's a prayer, and it's a message to the Father who created this woman before him, saying, My God, how long will you leave your creation to brandish your loving law to usurp you and tear each other apart? And a breeze blows the dust, shifts the jots and tittles, and something in the juxtaposition of that ancient script arranges itself in an unusual way, strikes him in a new light, reading, Justice will have its way. Take the higher road and leave the rest to me. Tell them, true justice is love. And so he collects himself, and so he stands up, and so he knows just what he'll do. These weak, wicked schemers, these cruel, foul wolves among the sheep, I'll drive them out of my house someday, and then they'll see what's what. So with grinding teeth on edge, with eyes brimming with sparks of lightning, with a voice of fire and the roar of a lion, he spouts, leave the sinless to condemn the sinner. And they stand back, shocked, stumbling like dominoes, their white eyes flashing wide, their trim mouths trembling open, their hearts tasting mere sparks of that fire which is bound to consume them at judgment day. And the rocks fall from their hands, the biggest first, dropping to the ground in mushroom clouds of sand, the fingers that clutched him now sprawled out in pure terror, their backs stabbed with the sudden pain. And the oldest leave before the others, the most decrepit, the most practiced in this ancient wrinkled game of kill or be killed, of holy wars and high horse tramplings. It is they who understand the meaning of this voice the most, the reverberating implications of what it would mean to lose their place in this empire built on broken slaves' backs, of tumbling down from this pack of cards to receive the full measure of what they dealt out to others, all those years of lies and hidden secret agendas. And she hears them leave, hears the rustling of the robes and the scurrying feet, feels the crunch of falling stones which she first imagines in her horrified mind or colliding with her shaking body, hurled from one of those righteous, upstanding citizens who knows what God thinks best. But surprised to hear them gone, as the fire slowly subsides, she lifts up her head with its shifting eyes, glancing warily left and right, in absolute amazement at the, what, what, the, what the rabbi has done, at how he did it, at who he is. For now she sees with the dawning trust that he is the only one with the power to dethrone and uplift, that he loves her, he loves her, and that the voices of accusation, those condemning, hateful rebukes that drove her to sin in the first place, were only ever whispering and shriveling at the back of her troubled head, and now are gone. Now they're gone, 
Now they're gone. And with a gasp and a voice of new breath, she says, They're gone. And he lifts her up with honor as if she's the purest white princess in a new queen robe, as if she's God's own daughter, and says, Go and sin no more. And with unswerving crystal eyes, he says, Go and sin no more. <laughs>